Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Right? So you have this mechanism, as long as you comply with some of the terms of this case. If you wanna if you wanna change the rules in your trust, you can write a new one, transfer all of the assets. That's the kind of the harder way. Then there is this simpler way. Um, and that is that non-judicial settlement agreements. Recently, the, the law relating to trusts in Massachusetts was changed. Massachusetts adopted something called the Uniform Trust Code, which had been adopted in other states. One of the provisions in the Uniform Trust Code is a device for amending an unamendable trust, or otherwise dealing with trusts that, where you need to do something that wasn't anticipated at the time the trust was created. They are called non-judicial settlement agreements. So in, in this case, if you had um, uh, Frank and Mary and Peter, Paul and Mary Jr., or in this case, if Frank was dead and you had Mary who had created this irrevocable trust, um, and then you had Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. who were the ultimate beneficiaries, and one of them was the trustee, the way this would apply is that as long as everybody signed on, as long as you did the right paperwork and all of the beneficiaries signed on to this change, you, Mary and her family would be able to change their trust, their irrevocable trust and unamendable trust to deal with all of the things that we just talked about. So I know that sounds bizarre. Only in the legal world can you have an unamendable trust that can be amended and actually have two different ways of doing it, right? Now, the, your question is, um, why in the world would you want to do that? Well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, none of the trusts that you now have are grandfathered. So if you have a defect, uh, you're not protected by the fact that you have an old trust. Uh, so if you're thinking of changing things, right, think about this, right? If, you're tr if the trust as it presently stands, and I'm, by the way, I'm sorry that this one is, is, I know I try to do presentations and don't make them too complicated, you know, but this is just, a, it's, it's, it's a very, very, it's an issue that affects a lot of people and it's just complicated. Um, if your trust right now is fine, and, and if it's going to be fine into the future, right? And you're not worried, and, and, you're, and you, think, well, you think it's just fine. You're a little worried about it, right? But you think it's fine. If it's fine right now, and it's been more than five years since you created it, and you do this change, either through the non-judicial settlement agreement or through the decanting, and then a year from now, you need to apply for mass health, right? Well, a year from now, obviously the trust hasn't been changed for five years, right? But the fact that you changed it does nothing at all to alter the fact that your existing trust is more than five years old, which means as long as it's fine, as long as it was fine in the first place, it's going to be okay. To the extent that your trust is now okay, it's going to still be okay after you've made those changes, right? If, on the other hand, your current trust is not okay, if there is something about it that you worry, or that your lawyer worries, right, could trigger mass health to deny and might, put, might expose you in the future, then by making that change, you are at least getting a new five-year clock running. So that if your current trust is defective, you're at least, you know, you're not like overjoyed that there may be a, defect, a defect, but at least you know, unless you're, you know, on the verge of going to a nursing home, or at least you know that five years from now, everything is going to be safe, right? So there is a reason to be thinking about doing it. So, I mean, each person, we're, we all have our own situations. You have to balance those things off. But think about that. Think about that possibility. Uh, now, one other issue that I want to talk about, which is briefer, this is another improvement that I think is coming down the pike regarding a very common issue in dealing with mass health, the so-called hardship waiver made better. Uh, most people don't know that if you are trying to qualify for mass health and you get a letter from mass health that says you were denied because you made gifts over the last five years totaling 
$50,000. You gave some money, you know, you helped one of your kids in college, you did this, you did that, but it was over the last five years and there's a presumption that you did that in order to qualify for Mass Health. So we're, gonna, we're sending you this notice. And what that notice would say today is you've been denied. Um, this period of ineligibility has been imposed on you in the nursing home, which says you're not going to qualify for a, a quite a while unless the $50,000 gets given back. Now, what that notice does not say, oh, and it'll also say, and you have 30 days to appeal. If you don't like our decision, you have 30 days to appeal to the next level, to this administrative law judge. What the notice does not say is that you also have another right. You have the right to request a hardship waiver, to say to MassHealth, yeah, I know, I gave away the money to my grandson so that he could go to college, right? But guess what? My grandson went to college, right? And he paid the tuition. He doesn't have the $50,000, because that's a little less than one year of college, right? He doesn't have the $50,000, right? And so, and so I'm, and I'm in a nursing home, or at least you know, the person who's applying says, my mother is in the nursing home. I'm in the nursing home, right? And I have no place to go. I have to be in a nursing home. I can't go home, right? There's nobody that can take care of me. You have the right to do that now. They don't tell you that in the notice, right? Um, that's the first problem. The second problem is that you have the right to do that now if you get denied mass health but you only have 15 days to do it, right? Shorter than the amount of time that you have to appeal the decision, right? And unless you've done it during those 15 days, if you, later, if you then appeal the decision and the decision and the decision doesn't go for you on appeal, at that point you can't apply for the hardship waiver, right? It's, it's awful, right? And there are no rules and regulations right now that MassHealth has any kind of standards to say, well, when is a gift appropriate you know, um, it, for, for asking for a hardship waiver. There's nothing like that in there. Well, there is a new bill, H.R. 3705. Kate Hogan, Representative Hogan from Stowe and Maynard, um, has filed that bill, and it's actually gotten out of committee and stands a reasonable chance of passage this year, and we'll keep you in touch regarding that issue. And what that bill would do is it will, ex first of all, extend that 15-day period to 90 days. So you have some reasonable amount of time, if you've been denied mass health, to, to figure out whether you have a legitimate reason for filing a hardship waiver. Secondly, it will require that mass health tell you that you have the right to do this in the notice. Because of course, most people, you know, unless you're doing this all the time, you get these notices from mass health and you say, you know, I've been denied, you know, or the, uh, my, you know, my wife or my, my parent has been denied, and so somebody's got to give all that money back, right? unless I appeal in 30 days, but I don't know if I can win an appeal. You don't know any of that. So now the notice is going to say that you have this right to file this hardship waiver. And MassHealth is being required, would be required under the bill to develop these regulations, to deal with things like, you know, you gave the money to your kid for college, right? Or you helped your daughter with her wedding. Or there are any number of reasons that having nothing to do with trying to qualify for MassHealth, which may be reasonable reasons, right, why you should be able to get a hardship waiver. So that's what's new. There is other legislation that is pending that is of interest, but it hasn't gone, they haven't gone anywhere. Nothing has gotten out of committee. So by fall, when I come back, I'll also give you a legislative update if anything else has changed. That's it. And by the way, if you've got this, this presentation together with all my presentations, I now upload them to my YouTube site. So if you want to see any, if you're not, if you're just dying to see this again, <laughs> because <laughs> you don't know what the heck I said and you want to, you know, see, or you want your daughter to see it or your son to see it, uh, just, th that's just, just, just Google that uh, or just Google Elder Law Frank and Mary and you can see this or many other fascinating shows. Uh, remember, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. So if none of this applies to you or it doesn't bother you, you know, it, fine. But my goal is to just make sure that you're aware of this stuff. Any questions? So that was a little bit, I think it's about exactly an hour. Thank you very, very much all. I'm glad to take questions afterwards. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you.